Welcome to Ohm Times TV, a division of Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting. Welcome to What is Going Ohm, for new thought from the edge of Ohm. Each week on Ohm Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought-provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. When we think about rulers of ancient Egypt, it's often the male pharaohs that come to mind. But there were female pharaohs too, some of whom were famous, like Cleopatra and Nefertiti, and many others who were mostly written out of history. But there's one female pharaoh who developed quite a cult following after her death, and many centuries later, became a Gothic icon through her role as the antagonist in Bram Stoker's shocking Egyptian novel, The Jewel of the Seven Stars, published in 1903. So who was Sobek Nefuru? Why was she written out of history for so long? Did she really use magic to secure her destiny? And why is so much of her story hidden behind a veil of mystery and imagination? Andrew Collins is a science and history writer who investigates advanced civilizations in prehistory. He is the co-discoverer of a massive cave complex beneath the Giza Plateau, now known as Collins Cave, and the author of several fascinating books that challenge the way we perceive the past, including Origins of the Gods and Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, just to name a few. A regular guest on radio shows, podcasts and TV series, including Ancient Aliens, The Unexplained with William Shatner and Gaia TV's Ancient Civilizations. Andrew Collins joins me now to talk about his latest book, The First Female Pharaoh, Sobek Nefuru, Goddess of 
the seven stars. Andrew Collins, welcome. Hello, Sandra. <clears throat> yes. So who is Sobek Neferu? Um, well, her name, let's start with that. Uh, Sobek was the very ancient crocodile god of Egypt, uh, probably went back even before the beginning of dynastic history. And Neferu basically means beauties. Um, so she was the beauties of the crocodile god. Um, so very clearly, this was one of her, you know, favourite gods, as it were. And eventually, I think she was responsible for um, creating Sobek as the state god of Egypt during her reign um, with the focus of attention, this huge complex known as the Labyrinth, which was located in the Fayum Oasis, which is about 60 miles to the southwest of modern day Cairo. Um, and I mean, she would seem to have created a, a religious cult um, not only surrounding um, Sobek, but also the mother of Sobek, who was Neith. And she was represented as a, uh, a hippopotamus, a standing hippopotamus. Uh, some people will know her under the name Tawarat, which just means great mother. Um, and together, these two figures were shown in the night sky as the stars of the constellation of Draco, Ursa Minor and Ursa Major. And they were the three constellations that revolved around the celestial pole, the northern celestial pole, which is one of the areas of interest anyway for the native, sorry, the, the, the ancient Egyptians, um, because it was in this direction that they believed the afterlife was actually located. But the thing about Sobek Nofru is most of the viewers will be saying, well, I've never heard of her. And that's because if you look at any book on ancient history, um, you know, specialising in Egypt, obviously, you'll only find a couple of pages on her, which is just pulling together information about what the, the ancient writers may have mentioned, um, you know, a few monuments that have been found uh, that mention her name or a few artefacts that have come up. And they don't really say much about her other than the fact that she reigned for just under four years and followed onto the throne uh, her brother, Amenemet the, the, the Fourth, and both of those were the offspring of a very successful um, pharaoh by the name of Amenemet the Third, who wrote, who reigned for about forty-five years, um, and basically, without Sobek Nofru, Egypt would have fallen, and I think the world would have been a completely different place to die. She was actually the saviour of Egypt, and that's the story which I want to tell you about. But as you mentioned at the, the top of the hour, basically we all know her, but from a fictional perspective, uh, because, as you said, Bram Stoker wrote a book called The Jewel of Seven Stars, uh, where um, Sobek Nofru appears under the name Queen Tira, T-R-A, um, and this book was used as the role model for many films where a Egyptian royal female rises from the dead to create havoc in the modern world, the most recent of which was 2017's um, The Mummy, in, uh, which uh, starred Tom Cruise. And, you know, this and many other films are all, are all based on Bram Stoker's work. There's no question about that at all. You know, so what, you know, who was this woman and you know, why, why, why is she so important and how did she basically save Egypt? Well, well hang on a second, Andrew, just before you get there, what I want to know is, why are why you, you so interested, interested in this woman? Well, I mean, she's been of interest to me for decades, basically. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that, people keep having dreams and visions about her. Um, and, you know, although she might not, um, you know, come across and give her name or whatever, but it's quite obvious that they're all seeing uh, the, the same character. And I found this interesting um, from a psychological perspective, from the simple reason that most people don't dream about Nefertiti or Cleopatra or the other famous um, female pharaoh who was Hatshepsut. Um, they don't dream about about these people. 
So why is it that Sobek Nofru seems to be coming through so strongly with people? And this prompted me to start looking into her monuments, looking into artifacts that uh, came from her reign, uh, and to gradually build this picture to basically find out whether the, the character of fiction did resemble the character of history. Uh, and in several ways, she absolutely did. Um, there's no question about that. And whether Bram Stoker was writing, you know, just fantasy or intuitively or what, doesn't seem to matter. He seemed to have got quite a lot of facts right about her. I mean, let's let's start with her story. I mean, basically, as I say, her father ruled Egypt for around 45 years. His name was Amenemet the Third. Now, this was the, the 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 dynasty, the twelfth dynasty, and all of this is happening towards the end of that dynasty. But this is also the age known as the Middle Kingdom, and all of that will soon be lost um, after the reign of Sobek Nofru, because what happens is that after this time, there's a dark age in Egyptian history known as the Second Intermediate Period. So. During the reign of her father, um, things started to change. He he started to allow a lot of Semitic peoples to enter into the country that began to settle in the northern part of the country, in the Nile Delta, all the way down to the area of what is today Cairo, uh, in particular the area around Heliopolis. Um, and, you know, they gradually built their own communities, their own population, and then towards the end of the father's life, Amenemet III's life, he actually appointed his, and we can only assume this, eldest daughter um, to be his successor. Now, her name was Nefertar, Neferu Tar. Um, and we know this because he even had her name put in a royal cartouche, which is like this, the oval that will go around the name of the pharaoh and this was the first time that a, a woman had, had had this honor to, to for her name to be put in a, a cartouche like this and she wasn't even you know ruling the country um so she was obviously being geared up to become the next pharaoh which in itself was obviously very progressive um but it would seem as if to because she would have been the probably the first female pharaoh to properly take over the country they thought the best thing to do is put her with her brother, who was also called Amenemet, like, like his father. And he probably was younger than her, probably only 14 to 16. Um, and this they were going to rule together. You know, she was obviously going to rule the country. He would be by her side. I mean, exactly what titles they'd have had, we don't know. But then she disappears. And we know that she dies because a makeshift tomb for her was made inside her father's pyramid at Hawara in the Fayum Oasis. Um, and this was a makeshift tomb. So that suggests that she died even before him. Um, but eventually her remains were removed to her own small pyramid uh, nearby. But we certainly know that she died during his reign. Now, this is interesting because this tells us that um, they probably had no plan B in, 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 because she was so young. Um, and so this probably put the country in turmoil initially. And it would seem as if the answer was let Armin Emmet the fourth reign basically as the Pharaoh. But it would seem as if their other daughter who would seem to, be of the same mother as Amenemet the fourth, but not of the same mother as Nefertar, come in and rule alongside him. And her name was Sobek Nofru. And for the first few years of his reign, they ruled side by side and probably, you know, were, were quite close. Um, and then something seems to have happened where they split apart and it would seem as if their political views seem to diverge in different directions. Um, but what also happened is because the, the new pharaoh was so young, I think he was being heavily influenced by people that had been in the cult of his father. Um, and this meant that these progressive um, 
um, you know, I, uh, ideologies were, were pushed even further and the borders were open even more. And a lot of people started to worry about this, that this could cause the downfall of Egypt. Um, and it would seem as if, and I, I'm going to say all this matter of fact, but the evidence is in the book itself, is that it would seem as if certain people came to Sobek Nofru, who was either ruling alongside her brother, officially or unofficially, and basically said to her, look, you know, the country is going to fall unless we do something about it. You know, the borders need to be closed. You know, you need to, you know, we need to stamp down authority on the country. We will back you and your claim to the throne if your brother can be got rid of. And it would seem as if that was what happened and that her brother was murdered. Um, now, whether she was directly or indirectly involved in it or whether she just gave the say so, I don't know. Um, but that allowed her then to take over the throne. Now, obviously, all of this might sound very heavy, but you know, these were different times. We're talking about Game of Thrones, like, you know, political intrigue of stuff going on, just as Maybe it would do, so at, at, you know, at, at much later times within the Ptolemies and, you know, the, the other great dynasties of Egypt. I mean, all of this was going on all the time. So, you know, and there were attempts on life and possibly murders within her own family, with her own immediate ancestors as well. So, you know, this was this was the only way that if you were going to become Pharaoh and remain on that throne, um, you had to be strong. You had to be mighty. If you were seen to be weak in any way, then you're going to be torn down within a few days or a few weeks of, of ascending to the throne. Um, so basically what she did was she closed the borders, stopped trading with Canaan and Sinai, which up to that point had been very profitable for Egypt, um, stamped down her, her authority and also initiated a new dynasty. And this new dynasty, which would be obviously the next one coming, was the 13th dynasty. And it would seem as if the first two kings of that, probably very, very young, um, were related to her or more obviously related to her brother. Um, they may have even been his children and they would have ultimately become the first two kings of the 13th dynasty. And they were loyal to her for some reason. And, you know, at least five of the kings of the 13th dynasty all were called Sobek Hotep, which means that they were loyal to, to the cult of Sobek. Um, they also deified Sobek Nofru. Um, you know, and continue to venerate her in death, uh, which is a really important point. But the thing was, is that as all this was happening, exactly what these nationalists suggested would happen to Egypt started to happen because a rival dynasty began in the northern part of the country called the 14th dynasty. And this was a Semitic led dynasty. In other words, the peoples that had come into the country were now taking control of the country. And, and what happened was that this paved the way for the entrance into Egypt of warlords coming in from Canaan who are remembered in history as the Hyksos or the Shepherd Kings. And they basically took over the whole show, particularly in the northern part of the country. They tolerated this weak 13th dynasty, which was pushed right to the southern part of the country um, and was based out of Thebes. Um, and there was a sort of stalemate went on for a while. But what what then happened is that the immediate descendants of the 13th dynasty, which was the 17th dynasty, I know it's confusing, you don't need to take all this in specifically, rose up eventually against the Hyksos and sent them packing back to Canaan. And thereafter began not just the 18th dynasty, and we won't even bother about the 16th, that's just so confusing, we won't even go there. Um, this began the 18th dynasty and the beginning of what's known as the New Kingdom. And of course, all of this had all your great kings like Ramesses II, Seti I, Topmosis, um, Hapsetshut, um, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and of course, Tutankhamun. And none of this would have happened if it had not have been for what Sobek Nofru did the chances are Egypt would have fallen completely and it would have probably just become another city state like many others in Canaan, uh, which were rivaling each other most of the time anyway. 
Um, and the world probably that we're in today would probably be in a different place. I mean, certainly we wouldn't have Art Deco because obviously that only began after we found the tomb of uh, Tutankhamun in 1922. Um, so, you know, in theory, she saved Egypt uh, by, you know, changing the, the political stance of, of the country. And even though they couldn't stop this second intermediate period, the dynasty that she initiated, the descendants of them would go on to, you know, win the day, essentially. And that would have not have happened without her. So why is she not remembered as a hero? And well, why, yeah, why was she written out of it? Well, sorry, well, I'm sorry. Why, why was she written out of it? Why was she? Well, um, I mean, an example of this can be found at Abydos in the southern part of Egypt, because on the walls there of the Temple of Seti the first are dozens of royal cartouches with all the names of the kings from the earliest times down to his own day. And in relief, you have Seti the first, and he has his son with him, and he's showing him all of these great kings that have ruled the country. And his son is the future Ramesses the second. And he's basically sort of saying, look, one day your name will be, you know, amongst these as, as the great people that have ruled our, our, our land. But the problem is, that if you look at the list, you have all the different pharaohs, including Amenemet the Fourth, Sobek Nofru's brother, and then no kings whatsoever until the first king of the 18th dynasty, who is Amos, one of the, the, the two brothers that was able to force the Hyksos out of the country. And so there's a huge gap, and Sobek Nofru is missing. Why? Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the yeah. answer, I mean, I can understand Seti the first not including the kings of the second intermediate period because, A, it was such a confusing period, and, B, they probably didn't want to be associated with this dark age. They just want to put it behind them and just forget about it. But why should they leave out Sobek Nofra? And the answer, I would say, is that they blamed her for it. They saw her as a part of it. So instead of her saving the day, they saw her as causing it. And because of that, her name was written out of certain king lists. Not all, I must point out, but certain of the king lists. So in other words, she was being tarred with the same brush as the, all of the, the kings of, of this very confusing dark age of Egyptian history. And because she was the first one to be omitted, quite clearly, it was almost certainly seen as her responsibility. So... And the, one of the reasons why I think all this happened is that at the end of her reign, it would seem as if they came for her. When I say they, uh, almost certainly, I think it was one of the priesthoods of the country. Uh, most obviously, the priests of Heliopolis, uh, who were the who who were the, uh, the the priests of the cult of Ra, or in his creator form, Artum. And the reason I say that is because they were working very heavily with the Semitic peoples and had been with her brother, Amenemet the Fourth. In fact, he had abandoned Sobek. He had abandoned the cult center of, of, Kobek, of, of Sobek in the Fayum region and was actually going to create a brand new kingdom in the Sinai, which was Semitic territory in its own right. And he was going to focus it around this uh, religious um, complex on, on a sort of mini mountain known as Serabat el Kadam, um, which was dedicated to the, 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 uh, the goddess Hathor. Uh, and this was a very important area because it was from here, from the mines close by, that turquoise, copper and malachite, um, you know, all were brought back into Egypt on these um, camel trains, not camel trains, um, caravan trains that were, you know, would go between the Sinai and Egypt to the border of Egypt that were controlled by the, the Semitic peoples. Now, so basically it would seem as if she would, was buried um, in secret, probably after uh, a death that involved suicide from all that I can see. Uh, in other words, just like Cleopatra, you know, much, much later would commit suicide so that 
you know, they couldn't come for her and drag her through the tra- streets and humiliate her before killing her publicly. Um, this is exactly what Sobek Neferu did. She, she, you know, took uh, the way out, having completed what she felt was good for the country, which was restoring what the Egyptians referred to as mart, which means divine order um, through justice and truth. Um, and having set up this new dynasty, the 13th, you know, she could go out peacefully, so to speak. Um, but it's clear that once she died, she was buried in secret because we can see this because I, the pyramid that was destined for her, which was constructed at a place called Masguna, which is just south of the Dashur pyramid field, um, was never used ever. You know, there's no evidence that, that anybody was ever interred in it. And also, interestingly, it was it was destroyed in antiquity. And when I mean destroyed, right the way down to the floor. And I find that 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 interesting in its own right. Um, but when the superstructure was uh, investigated in 1910, uh, it was found that nobody had ever been buried there. And there was also a lot of strange peculiarities about it. The British um, Egyptologist who did the work there, who was Ernest Mackay, um, found that there was complete oddities in the way that it was built, completely different to every other pyramid um, in the way it was entered, its directionality, the fact that its whole interior was painted red. Um, And I mean, when I say painted red, I mean, beyond anywhere that was aesthetically done, you know, right at the sides of everything, places where... It wouldn't have mattered what colour it was, was all painted red. And why would it be painted red? Well, red was is obviously the colour of blood, but it's the colour associated with a force called Sekem. Sekem means divine might or mighty power. um, And it is the root behind the word Sekhmet. And Sekhmet was a lioness headed goddess um, who was the, the, the fierce, terrifying foal of uh, the goddess Hathor, who would seem to have been very important to Sobek Nofru on a personal level. I mean, on a state level, Sobek was very important to her, but on a personal level, it would seem to have been Hathor. And one of the reasons why she would have adopted Sekhmet is because if she had to rule the country with might, basically, then this was the idealistic divine force to evoke. And even the name of her funeral complex, which is recorded, was called Sekem Sobek Nofru, which, you know, obviously means, you know, the, the divine might of, of Sobek Nofru. So she even wanted to use that term in death, basically. But what would appear to have happened is that wherever she was buried, uh, and we can go into this, um, that the 13th dynasty, the, 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 the Sobek kings that followed her, they venerated her. They deified her in death. And what's so interesting is that when we come into the New Kingdom period, it's clear that people had no idea where she was buried because they're going in random tombs from the 12th dynasty, you know, basically thinking it's connected with her and writing messages uh, in honour of her, not realising that, you know, it's got it's a tomb that nothing to do with her. Um, so it's clear that that there was no public awareness of where she was buried, even just, you know, a few hundred years after her time. So she really was eradicated from Egyptian history. Now, I'm not saying that every mention of her went, but a lot of it did. And it's a shame because quite clearly, not only was she the saviour of Egypt, but also she was the first official pharaoh female pharaoh of of, of the country there there was none before there had been a couple of women who had risen up to take control of the country um either as regents or as um you know because their their husbands were out out fighting on a battle or something like this but sobek nofru was the first one to be officially crowned up with the, the the double crowns of upper and lower egypt I have, I have to, to hold, hold there, there Sandy, and because we, we have, have to take, take a short, short break. break. You're, You're listening, listening to What to... Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest today is science and history writer and author of Origins of the Gods and Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, and featured Ancient Aliens guest Andrew Collins. And we're talking about his latest book, 
the first female pharaoh, Sobek Neferu, um, goddess of the seven stars. We'll be back with more from Andrew Collins after this break. Om Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times flagship radio show, What is Going On? And as an author, editor, and 13 times book judge, who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked, what's really worth reading and what's not? So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees, and no BS, just an ever-growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favorite authors and teachers, plus free book excerpts, audios, and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo, and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club, get inspired and save money at the no BS spiritual book club.com. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Andrew Collins, Sebek Neferu was quite a controversial figure. I mean, there's a, a lot of talk about her, um, you know, taking part in unorthodox religious ceremonies, invoking the power of magic to help her ensure her destiny. How much of that is true? Um, most of it, I should think. Um, I mean, I, I think we have to remember that when she started out, um, let's say, as a, as, as a teenager, there is no way at all that she would have seen herself as uh, ascending the throne. I mean, she had an elder sister um, who would be first, you know, in line for the throne. She had a brother who was probably about the same age as her, who would also have been in line for the throne before her. So, you know, it would seem as if there was no way that she could have, have, have become Pharaoh. And I think what's important to remember is that, when a child is born and, you know, a, a child that, that is destined to become Pharaoh's born, they are seen to be the incarnation, um, a living God themselves um, under the name Horus. Then the mother is seen as an incarnation of Horus's mother, who is Hathor. So, you know, in other words, when the, the mother is carrying the child, they are carrying that divine child. So in theory, that they should know who it is that's going to be on the throne next because they're carrying the divine God within them. And I don't think that was the case with Sobek Nofru. Something must have happened in her life to change the way that she thought. I mean, all the evidence seems to suggest that she was a, she was training as a priestess in a temple in the early parts of her life. So in other words, she had committed herself to um, a religious lifestyle. Now, whether this was with the temple of Hathor uh, or a similar goddess, I don't know. Possibly, I'm, I'm pretty certain, though, it is Hathor. 
Um, and then something happened. And I think that somebody came to her and said to her, look, you know, you are very special. You know, you are destined to for big things. You are destined to rule the country. We will help you. But you've got to prove yourself. Um, and I think she underwent unorthodox religious rites. Now, under what name? I don't know whether it was under Hathor or whether it was under another god or goddess. I don't know. And the thing that, that this is that I think that, that she passed with flying colours, so to speak, and that this allowed her to believe for the first time that she was destined to rule the country. And once that was in her head, nothing was going to stop her, basically. Um, and I mean, this is, of course, you know, I mean, in, in a way, this was a premonition because quite clearly she would end up ruling the country. So, you know, it may well be that whoever it was that came to her, you know, was somebody that was working from intuition or from psychic messages or, or from dreams. We don't know. But the clue to this is the fact that there is a statue that appears to show her. I mean, 95 percent it shows her and she is wearing a particular uh, cloak, basically, and it's known as the Hebsed cloak. And the thing is that this would appear to have been worn by her at her coronation. Again, this is not me. This is what some Egyptologists have said. And the, the, the importance of this is that the Hebsed festival, where, where you get this cloak as a reward, basically, a, a pharaoh only undergoes after they've ruled the country for about 30 years. And then what happens is that the king, because they're in theory getting older, obviously, they have to undergo a series of um, physical and mental trials to show that they're a sound body and mind to continue ruling the country. And once they do this and they pass, they continue, they're allowed to continue on for another five years or so. And another similar event will occur after that. And then they get, you know, they, so they get their coat, the Hebsed cloak after that. And obviously that's the sign that they've gone through. So why should Sobek Nofro be wearing one at her coronation? And it's very clear that this was her statement saying, look, I have done enough. I have proved myself to the gods and goddesses that I am worthy to rule this country. And I'm going to show you this by wearing the Hebsed cloak which is obviously an incredibly bold thing. And she's wearing a very unique headdress as well, made out of a vulture and, and snake, which is, you know, totally unique. Very, very strange. And so that, I think, was part of her conviction. So, yes, I mean, she was obviously involved with, with um, unorthodox uh, religious uh, or magical activities. But this was only the start because quite clearly Sobek was a very, very ancient god of Egypt it was basically he was basically seen as a star god and there's a lot of indications that she was very interested in the stars of the northern sky and also the area of the northern Fayum area because there's a huge lake there called Birkit Kalum which in ancient times was known as Lake Morris um, it's a huge huge great great lake and on the north side of it there's a very strange megalithic temple um, made of polygonal blocks. I mean, it, it looks out of a completely different epoch uh, and probably dates back to the Old Kingdom, but it was refitted in the interior, I would say, during her reign or certainly during the reign of her brother. And I found two pieces of evidence, hieroglyphic evidence, which tells us that she was associated with this. And this has never been published before. And I think that she was the person that redesigned this monument. But what's interesting is it's aligned to the setting of a bright star in the constellation of Draco, which was associated with Sobek. In fact, it was probably the eye of Sobek, which was El-Tanan, el, -Tanan, el And what's interesting is that her pyramid at Mezguna is also aligned to the same star. And it's aligned by virtue of the fact that between the pyramid and the, the star as it sets were two other pyramids from the Old Kingdom Pyramid, uh, period. One is the Red Pyramid of Dashur that was built by um, uh, Snefro, um, one of the most important kings of, of that pyramid. And the other one was the Great Pyramid itself, which was built by, by Khufu, who was the son 
of Snefro. So she wanted to align herself, not just with these stars, but also these kings that she saw in terms of the ancestors. But this megalithic temple, I think, is very, very special. And there's a lot to do with that, to do with a snake cult, the seven weird chambers and whatever. Um, but basically, I would say that, yes, she was quite heavily involved with magic of all sorts. And what's so interesting is that um, that ve because very little was known about her, um, when the Egyptologists came to start investigations um, and exploration of the Fayum region at the early part of the 19th century, and they started coming across stone blocks with her name on it, you know, they, they were basically wondered who that who she was. And they, they tried to connect her with any names that were mentioned in classical accounts. And there was one by the um, the, the, the Egyptian chronicler of, of the king list by the name of Manetho, who was writing about 250 BC, of a female um, king by the name of Schemiophorus. And it was said that she was the sister of the the king that had ruled before her, whose name was Amenemes. Well, that's unquestionably Amenemes the fourth. So Schemiophorus and Sobetnofer are the same character. In fact, the names uh, can be shown to be exactly the same. But that was it. Nothing else really was known about it, other than what was being dug up by the Egyptologists and what was being found in inscriptions. So uh, there was a lot of speculation about who she was. And this was eventually picked up on towards the end of the 19th century by a mythologist and writer of Egyptian studies named Gerald Massey. And he basically saw her as the revival of this very ancient star cult involving um, Sobek, the crocodile, the god Set, and the hippopotamus goddess, who we know, as I said, is Neith, um, who he referred to as the great mother of time. Or great mother, mother goddess of time. He also referred to this hippopotamus goddess as the goddess of the seven stars. And it was this that Bram Stoker read that allowed him to create his character of Queen Tira in the novel, The Jewel of Seven Stars. And, you know, it's all there. I mean, obviously, that's even where the title comes from, the Jewel of Seven Stars. It was from the Goddess of the Seven Stars. So um, that's and, and so that's really how she comes back into the modern age. Uh, Bram, St Bram Stoker writes about her. And what's interesting about Bram Stoker is that the, the very first edition of the Jewel of Seven Stars um, was so shocking to the post-Victorian, the Edwardian audience of 1903, that the publishers called him back in and said, look, Bram, you know, it, it, yeah, this, the, there is no happy ending in this book. You know, would you please write one where everybody lives happily ever, ever, ever after? So that's what he did. Um, he wrote a happy ending for the subsequent editions so that, um, you know, supposedly please, please the, the reading audience. But obviously I would advise you to read this book. Um, and if you are, make sure that you get hold of the first edition, uh, not the subsequent editions. So, as I said, it's this story that ends up influencing various horror films where a uh, Egyptian royal female, whether it be a queen, a pharaoh, um, or even a princess comes back to life in the modern age and creates havoc um, with the latest being the mummy uh, from 2017 starring Tom Cruise. But by far the best rendition of or adaption of the Jewel of Seven Stars, in my opinion, is 1980s film The Awakening starring Charlton Heston and Susanna York. Um, this is by far the best I mean, a lot of it is actually set out in a ancient egypt um and the portrayal of the, the the queen in there who's who's referred to as kara which is interesting as sobek nofru's throne name is sobek kara so it's in mm -hmm. you know it's quite clear that they're they're talking about exactly the same character 
I want to, um, and uh, sorry for getting cut off then, we had a power cut here. Um, question, you talked earlier about many people having dreams of yeah. her. Um, she had this renaissance, you know, and became an icon all over again in, in the Victorian era. Mm. Um, the book had something to do with that, yeah. um, Bram Stoker's book. But I would probably think that the book actually came out after there was already some uh, interest being shown. There was. In yes. This yeah. is when all of the um, discoveries were taking place. You know, the Egyptian, the um, many archaeologists go in there finding things. Um, also, it was the time when we had a big um, lot of interest in hermeticism in, um, you know, Madame Blavatsky, seances, psychic phenomena, all exactly. of that kind of thing. Do you think there is some kind of connection there on some other level, unseen level, that when we start bringing all this thing into the open, it begins to impinge on people's consciousness yeah. and they can yeah, have dreams? Absolutely. I mean, going back to what you said about, you know, Hermetica, um, is that obviously the Victorian era was the age of a lot of occult, you know, orders and groups. And one of those was the Golden Dawn, yes. uh, which had branches in, in many cities around the world. Um, but the one in London um, had some very, you know, colourful uh, people involved with it. Uh, one of those was a lady by the name of Florence Farr. Um, she was an actress, um, a writer, uh, a musician, uh, playwright um, and she uh, wrote books on, on ancient Egypt you know as you say more the, the hermetic side of it and she would visit the British Museum a lot and she became attached to a coffin and a mummy uh, there which she believed was talking to her and she started referring to the spirit of this mummy as the Egyptian contact and the Egyptian contact would come through and talk through her or through a medium or whatever of her group, which was like an inner group of the Golden Dawn known as the Sphere, the Sphere group. Um, and a lot of the people who were not involved with this group, but also belonged, but actually actually belonged to the Golden Dawn, started to get quite worried about this. They believed that this Egyptian contact contact was influencing you know, them and was perhaps taking the group in, in, in the wrong direction. Um, in fact, at one point, um, it was even described by, by one of the, I think the secretary of, of, of it, Annie Horneman, as virtually evil. I mean, that's virtually what the, the word she, she used. Um, and the thing is that Bram Stoker was on the edge of this scene. Uh, he was a manager at the Lyceum Theatre, where also Florence Farr, uh, actually work was, you know, doing plays there. And, you know, there were various other occultists involved with the Lyceum and that social group. Um, and I think that, that this was one of the things that influenced Bram Stoker because in his book, a woman who is the daughter of the Egyptologist who finds the tomb and brings the sarcophagus and coffin and, and the mummy back to Britain, it's the daughter, the 18-year-old daughter, that gradually becomes possessed, taken over by the spirit of Queen Tira, who, as I said, was this, um, you know, a uh, pharaoh of Upper Lower Egypt, female pharaoh. So in other words, I think that it's basing on Florence Farr. But what's so interesting is that these ideas eventually are taken up by other later occultists like Kenneth Grant, for instance, in various books that, that he wrote uh, about, like the history of magic in different countries and how it all goes back to common sources. He talks a lot about Egypt, he, about star cults and, you know, that Sobek and whatever. And he talks a lot about Sobek Nofru in there. So she's very, very important in the occult world. And, I mean, in the book, basically, I, I, I actually even give examples where Sobek Nofru came through to to Kenneth Grant's group um, and unquestionably influenced what he would write about in his non-fiction and fictional works. Um, and, you know, beyond that, people are still to this day having visions and dreams of Sobek Nofru. And 
I mean, she's even got her own fe festival date, which is July the 23rd, which is this coming Sunday. Uh, yes, I mean, yes, if you yes. don't believe it, look it up online. Uh, so July the 23rd, which is a, a very interesting date. It's always associated with the, the rising of Sirius in Egypt. Um, and I mean, you know, light a candle for her there and maybe track down the film The Awakening from 1980, which you can look at for free on, on YouTube. Let me ask you this question then. I'm going to stretch this a little bit further. Um, in your book, Origins of the Gods, co-authored with Greg Little, you um, take the aliens and ancient aliens concept to the next level, saying that um, ultra in, ultra terrestrial intelligences have been affecting human evolution ever since our earliest ancestors. Um, do you think, when we look at how, you know, the whole system of the gods with the Egyptians, the whole, you know, everything we read about them, um, definitely smacks of something that isn't necessarily completely terrestrial. Do you think there is an ultra terrestrial element in this story? Um, well, if there is to do with Sobek Nofru, uh, it's not easy to, to pick through, I don't think. Um, but I mean, it's always been my belief that, you know, humanity has had help uh, from higher intelligences. And, you know, many years ago, I believe that they were probably of an extraterrestrial origin and involved flesh and blood aliens coming here in nuts and bolts spacecraft. But as the years went by, I realized that this answer was totally insufficient to explain you know, UFO encounters, UFO abductions, um, dreams, visions, uh, you know, the, the fact that people experiencing this sort of this type of phenomenon also had poltergeist, were also very psychic, whatever. I mean, you know, it was totally inadequate. And eventually I came to the conclusion, uh, as you, you can read from in Origins of the Gods, that we were possibly dealing with something that was outside of normal space time, something that was either four or five dimensional or possibly even 11 dimensional in nature. And, you know, this has been something that myself and my friends and colleagues have looked at and worked alongside with for quite a few years now. And we've referred to these entities as N beings, N dimensional beings, um, the N standing for number because we don't know how many dimensions are involved. So you just put the letter N. It's a mathematical um, character that's used. Um, and I'm prepared to believe that this could be an answer to the intelligences, not only behind a lot of UFO encounters, but also um, the intelligences that may well have been influencing us all the way along and that they are able to manifest in our world through a substance known as plasma. Plasma is the false state of matter. It's also been seen as possibly containing an extra dimension of space. There are various good references to this, uh, and I outline all of this evidence in Origins of the Gods and show why this almost certainly is so. Yeah. Jeff, um, Greg Little and I did touch on that when oh, right. okay. I did an interview with him about Origins of the Gods, and it's a fascinating area. We've only got a few minutes left. There's a couple of questions I want to ask sure. you. You've explored many, many ancient sites, including some of the more recently discovered ones, Gebekli Tepe, Kesem Cave. You co-discovered the massive cave complex. You know, you've, it's now known as the Collins Cave. Of all the incredible places you've investigated and experienced, which for you is the most outstanding and compelling? Um, well, let's go for two. One's easy, and that's the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. I mean, if you've never been there, you've got to go there and go in a private tour. You know, don't go there with 100 other people. Um, I mean, you know, this is not an advert, but we are actually going there in November um, as part of a tour. Go on to my website, andrewcollins.com. Come along with us if you fancy, you know, going to Egypt on a cruise and tour and whatever. But the other site um, that is just so compelling to me is Karahan Tepe, which is the sister site of Gobekli Tepe. I mean, you've just got to look at that. I mean, just look it up online, Karahan Tepe, and just look at the bizarre rock architecture that's over 11,000 years old 
that's recently been uncovered. I've just finished a book um, and submitted it to Inner Traditions, uh, which almost certainly will be called Karahan Tepe, um, which goes into exactly what might have been going on there 11,000 years ago. And I'm sure when it comes out this time next year, hopefully I'll be back on this show. Well, yes. I mean, this is a, f a subject that absolutely fascinates me. And I was going to ask you, what are you working on next? And you just told us, do you have something lined up now, now that you've handed that one in? Are you working yeah. on another one? Well, I mean, more of the same is the honest answer. I mean, the, the thing is that you haven't just got Gobekli Tepe or Karahan Tepe now. You've got at least a dozen of these sites that, were, that all have T pillars. Some of them are being excavated for the first time this year, and they may well prove to be even bigger and more important and more spectacular than Gobekli Tepe. Um, I've been onto this culture since my book From the Ashes of Angels came out in 1996. I predicted that you would find this high culture in exactly this area, and I was writing that at the very same time that the first spades were going in the ground at Gobekli Tepe. So I've been proved to be correct in that account. Um, so really, it, it's something that is very close to my heart now. Um, I would say Turkey, you know, is my second home and I go out there regularly. The next time we're going there is September on one of our tours. Again, by all means, come along with us on that. Full details on andrewcollins.com. Or we're going back there again next May and September. And these are not just holidays where you lie on the beach. I mean, you know, incredible discoveries are made. You know, not just by us, myself, my colleague Hugh Newman, JJ Ainsworth, but also the people who come along. I mean, we throw it open to them and say, what do you think is going on at these sites? And, you know, and we have incredible uh, discoveries that are made. And um, some of these, you, well, you can see just from a video that was done by Hugh Newman and myself just in the last week that um, through something that, that came out on the last tour in May, we realised that the so-called pillar shrine at uh, Karahan Tepe is actually a three-dimensional head of a snake. I mean, it's extraordinary. And this is over 11,000 years old. So that's clearly where I'm, I'm going to continue my work into the future. It's an exciting time for anybody who is interested in our real history. And I think now that we have the technology to be able to see what is hidden, um, yeah, you know, there's so much more that's going to emerge. Andrew, we have to leave it there, unfortunately. Do come back and talk about your next book. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. The first female pharaoh, Sebek Neferu, goddess of the seven stars, is published by Inner Traditions Bear and Company. And as you've learned, for more information about Andrew Collins' work, his books and more, and his events and trips, visit his website at andrewcollins.com. You can also interact with him on his Facebook page, which you can find by searching Andrew Collins Author. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back with another edition of What Is Going On at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me, and thank you again to Andrew Collins. <laughs>